¿Qué tal amigos? Grateful to be here with you all in Bogota. We're streaming to you somewhere on the internet. Happy to be here. Um, yeah, like Evan said, today we're talking Ethereum.org, my favorite subject. Um, let's see if I can figure out this thing. Good start. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, I guess quick participation, get you guys moving. Raise your hand if you've ever visited ethereum.org before. Excellent. Keep your hand up if you've contributed to ethereum.org. Awesome. If you haven't yet, you should come by our booth, pick up some swag. Um, maybe raise your hand if you're interested in maybe contributing to ethereum.org. Cool. All right, I'll try to increase that hand count with this talk. So, quick agenda. That's me, shilling ethereum.org to you. And then maybe some time for questions at the end, but probably not because I tend to talk too much. So really the goals of this talk, um, like ethereum.org as a project has evolved over the years. Um, and I think it's helpful context, both for potential contributors, existing contributors, but also just other projects in the space that often have to create, you know, like educational content, trying to be, you know, credible and trustworthy. So I'm, I'm hoping that kind of going through some of the history, some of the direction of where I think we're heading with ethereum.org, um, yeah, hopeful that'll provide some useful insight um, for the folks here. So, The way I at least think about ethereum.org, and this is just my opinion, this isn't any official stance of the Ethereum Foundation, um, but I kind of look at it as early history um, up until 2018, kind of present day, um, really the last three years that I've been working on it at least, somewhat shifting into a new direction. Um, and then, you know, from where we are today, until, you know, decades, millennia from now, um, where does ethereum.org go in the future? So, let's start with the past. And as often as useful with the past, we can check out the good old way back machine. Yeah, shout out to Brewster Kale over here, hero of the internet, internet archive and crew. I actually saw Brewster at breakfast today, but I was too embarrassed to come say hi. So I, I love you, Brewster, though. You're, you're a good man. Um, so you can check out, you know, early days of ethereum.org from a placeholder website in early 2014 to, you know, like alpha client release, ether sale, network launch. Um, and even as, you know, if you saw Aya's talk in the opening ceremonies, you know, coming as like, current day to like 2018. Um, interesting to kind of check out the website and just like see what it's about, see what's mentioned. Um, as she kind of brought up, I think a big theme and not that this was wrong at all. I think it was perfectly adequate for the time and you know where Ethereum as a project was and where the community was. Um, you know, the website was open source but it was pretty much driven by the Ethereum Foundation. Um, tens of contributors, a few pages of content, um, pretty much all the projects mentioned on the website were built by folks primarily within the foundation, you know? Download a client, download a wallet, run said client, write smart contracts with a programming language, deploy it using tooling, read content and documentation, pretty much all largely built by the Ethereum Foundation. And again, not a bad thing, just kind of a reflection of where things were at that point in time. Um, and I think like the short gist is like, ethereum.org basically was the Ethereum Foundation, um, which, you know, kind of moving to the present day over the past three years, where we've tried to kind of shift this, Um, is 
really to more of a community-driven initiative. And you know, here's a, a blog post launch from April 2019, um, and I think that you know, a little tagline built by the community for the community, I think really tries to capture that ethos well. Um, and what you know, folks did even before I joined was start a new website, basically a blank slate. Um, it was five pages of content, pretty sparse, um, but started with like a new mission and a set of principles that you know what, like we want to create this as a community project. It's a public educational good. It's built in the open with the community's help. Like Ethereum, the ecosystem, the goal was to iterate, evolve, experiment over time, and, and grow and evolve with Ethereum. So kind of looking at how that manifests today, you know, whether you're looking to get ETH in Colombia, buy some lunch with it maybe, who knows? Find a wallet, compare different options, explore applications built on Ethereum that you can use today, you can tell the kind of general theme here is like different from those 2018 screenshots, like we list all ecosystem built projects, right? Like basically not much is built by the foundation these days. And I think that's a testament just to like the incredible growth, strength of this ecosystem, very exciting to be a part of. Um, yeah, hundreds of pages, thousands of contributors at this point. Millions of people visit the website each month. Again, largely thanks to you folks in this room for just making Ethereum a sweet place to be. Um, and I think, yeah, the main gist again of, of this second present day era is really Ethereum.org is separate from Ethereum Foundation. Um, it's, yes, there is a core team. I am one of them. I'm one of the fortunate few who gets to, you know, get paid to work on this full time, um, but it's a very small core team, currently 10 of us. Um, and again, compare that to the nearly 1,000 contributors from code to content on GitHub, 4,000 plus translators, all volunteers who are helping, you know, spread the gospel, educate the people on, on the good stuff that is Ethereum. Um, so here kind of wanted to spend some time of just like, the nuances of how do you try to create this credible platform, um, largely content and education. I think in some ways it's fair to compare us to like a, a web two marketplace of sorts. You know, I showed screenshots where we show different products, show different wallets, um, but you know, we don't make money. We don't run affiliate marketing campaigns. Um, we don't get kickbacks from clients for downloading a specific one. Um, and I think a lot of open source projects, a lot of ecosystems within the Ethereum space kind of wrestle with these similar tensions or considerations and yeah, just figured it'd be worth uh, hopefully generating some discussion on. So first, wanted to talk about credible neutrality maybe something you've heard about before. Some guy named Vitalik wrote a good post about it in early 2020. Um, it's about mechanism design, and you know he's largely talking about blockchain protocols in this article, but I think it does apply pretty well to a website like ethereum.org where we're trying to build um, you know, this trustworthy, neutral platform. Um, in that post, he mentions, you know, like four steps to, to go through. Basically, don't discriminate, uh, make it transparent and, and auditable, uh, keep it simple and try not to change it. Um, for us in practice, I think we do this pretty well. I would say like the one kind of nuance here is like, in reality, we do want specific outcomes. Um, Vitalik even mentions in the post, you know, like a mechanism can be totally credibly neutral and it can also still be horrible. So like we don't want to create a horrible website. 
Um, we do want to avoid discrimination. We don't want to be kingmakers. We don't want to send all traffic to one wallet or one client. We do want certain outcomes. I think at a very hand wavy level, you know, we want to spread Ethereum values, um, such as promoting decentralization and creating a decent UX, right? Like we could be totally neutral again, but if it's a super shitty website that everyone bounces from and no one starts learning about Ethereum, I think we're kind of failing in what we're trying to do here. So again, examples of how that manifests, you know, like we do encourage people to run their own node. Um, we talk about the benefits of doing that. We, we do explain the benefits of staking on Ethereum. And we do show somewhat of a hierarchy of like different ways you can do that. Um, you know, ranking things from most trust assumptions or least trust assumptions to most. Um, so there are some opinions we kind of put into the product. And I think just recognizing that we aren't 100% neutral and we have no opinions of our own, I think that's just not really fair to say. I think the importance is just being transparent about it. Um, going further, just showing some pooled staking products, for instance, you can see we do try to guide the user on like considerations involved with some of these, some of these products. So the approach we basically take, we think it's okay to you know, be opinionated about, for instance, the listing criteria we make, how a product gets added and listed on ethereum.org. Um, but as much as we can, be neutral and objectively evaluate those projects against that listing criteria we create. Um, and again, make the, make the process transparent. So going back to here again, you can see we choose what projects are being evaluated on based on input from the community um, and then try to objectively assess those, those projects. And we make it transparent. Anyone can see our listing policies. Anyone can propose changes. Anyone can submit an issue, suggest additions or edits. Um, and we think that's kind of a healthy way to, to nurture that content. Second up, subtraction. Aya and others have also touched on this. I think it's a good general ethos of the Ethereum Foundation as a whole. Ethereum.org very much inherits that of like, we're not trying to be the end all be all only place you go to monolithic website to do all your Ethereum stuff, right? We see ourselves as like a limited product focused on specific areas. You know, where do we uniquely add value? This is largely areas that companies aren't incentivized to actually do. Um, often, you know, public goods falls into this bucket. There's just maybe not enough incentives, not enough resources to, uh, to tackle this. Thinking through, you know, where does it make sense for us to focus our efforts? Where can we make the best impact? Um, and how do we kind of, over time, slowly reduce our relevance? You know, again, I mentioned we have a core team of 10 right now. Um, sometimes there's considerations of like, are we trying to go far? Or are we trying to go fast, right? Like we could ship this feature, we could write this content immediately or very quickly if we just did it ourselves. But if we do want to build a growing community, a sustainable community, reduce the reliance of core contributors over time, um, these are some like questions, questions we think through. So examples of, yeah, where we see ourselves in a unique position to add value, I think, you know, 2019, it was very simple. Like, uh, there was a lot of low-hanging fruit. There just wasn't a lot of great content out there covering some of the basics of Ethereum. I mean, shout out to the ETHUB guys who like, very much carried that weight in a big way. I think like 2018, 2019, and beyond. Um, but to create content that just explains some of the basics to, to get over the obstacles and the fears of like, how do I break into this magic internet money crazy landscape. Um, developer documentation was another big one. I don't know if there's any other devs who were super frustrated back in 2018 of just outdated medium posts, libraries that completely broke their APIs, no way to keep stuff up to date, no way to translate that updated information. 
Um, so that was like really the base foundation of like where it made sense in our eyes of like, okay, there's some basic, neutral, simple information that we can provide, we can translate. Where to focus our efforts? This is something we think about, right? There's tons of projects in the space at this point. Where does it make sense for us to focus? I think layer two is one good example. You know, over the past year or so, fees getting crazy high, people couldn't even use the network. Educating users, encouraging them to like, hey, these are you know, early days for these projects, but maybe worth checking out as a way to, um, you know, to, to use, use the protocol. Similarly, you know, I think a good example of here is like we have a listing criteria, what layer twos we show. Um, and as part of that, we basically just say like, hey, if you're listed on l2beat.com, that's one of the criteria for getting included on ethereum.org. And I think that's a good example of subtraction and in, in the sense of like recognizing, hey, there's another cool project that has a team of experts that have a fairly robust framework analyzing the risks of different layer two protocols. We don't have that expertise in house, we could hire for that, but maybe we could just collaborate with teams in the space where it makes sense. Um, and I think that's a good example of, of such a collaboration. And lastly, just an example of, yeah, again, how do we think about going far versus going fast? We publish you know, our product roadmaps every quarter on GitHub. We try to do our best to like where it makes sense, um, engage the community. You know, recently we chose to migrate to a new UI library, trying to like increase accessibility on the website. Um, and we like called out to the community of developers of like, hey, you wanna help us migrate a bunch of components? People could sign up on GitHub. We created documentation around how to do this. We answered questions in Discord from people looking to learn how to do this. This took a lot of time. Pablo, our developer leading this project, could have just cranked out all of this on his own, probably a lot faster than it took otherwise. Um, but through this process, you know, we got tens of contributors who are now regularly coming back, looking to continue their TypeScript chops, you know, looking to improve as a React developer. Um, some of the core team from Chakra has now gotten involved in like collaborating with us on this front. So I think this is another good example of just like, it sucks up front to just like invest in the education, the outreach, to really bring in people who, who want to contribute. Um, but if you're thinking about the long run, this can be a very effective way to, to grow that community over time. Third, reinventing the wheel. Real quickly, I think like crypto's reinventing many industries. Education doesn't necessarily need to be one of them. There's a lot of great resources out there of like, hey, crowdsourced, educational, public good content. Um, Mozilla Developer Network in particular was a huge source of inspiration for us. Um, they've just done an awesome job for almost multiple decades at this point in terms of just like volunteer driven community documenting web standards. Um, translating that content, doing a kick-ass job of just like providing excellent resources. Here you can see an MDN page. Here you can see an ethereum.org page. Looks pretty similar. Um, shout out to Ryan Cordell, if he's here, um, who designed this page for us. Also Carl Faircloth and Alex Singh helped us with a lot of designs in the early days. And just kind of like basic techniques, again, learning from other projects, not reinventing the wheel. Hey, make a big edit button on your page, right? Make it one, two, three clicks to open a pull request. Wow, look at that. Um, and you know, that's not the only reason that we've seen growth and contributions from the community over time. Obviously, bull markets help, you know, hype around the protocol helps. Um, but from you know, just like open issues and PRs, even by individual contributors you can see here, like it helps to proactively engage people and get them involved, get them empowered. Very much along those lines, community engagement. Here's some ways that you can contribute to ethereum.org. You can learn more there. Um, hundreds of pages of content, again, thousands of contributors, 
50 languages supported. Um, we're pretty active in Discord and Twitter. Um, and basically given as many avenues as possible to like potentially recruit people who, 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 wanna, who wanna get involved. I think a big one is just recognizing that different people are motivated in different ways, right? Like it's sweet to get paid, sure. Some people want rewards, but others want just recognition. Um, some people just want access. Some people wanna learn, some people wanna teach. Um, some people just wanna feel heard and heckle us on Twitter, you know, that's okay. That's contributing in your own way. Um, so I guess my tip on this would just be experiment with different approaches along those lines. Um, and we have in the past, you know, whether it's bug bounties similar to the, the protocol bug bounties themselves, um, you know, just recognition of contributions through leaderboards on the website, offering certificates to translators who can then put that on their LinkedIn or on their resume, simple shout outs to people on the website for helping out, open community calls, I think, again, pretty basic stuff for a lot of open source Web3 projects these days, um, but just being available, having an open Discord, I think can go a long way. Poops, who here likes poops? Love those poops. Um, get poops, all sorts of poops. Um, jobs, yeah. I mean, I mentioned we have a core group of ten people. I'm super proud that you know half of us started as open source contributors, just helping out on the website. Um, the Ethereum Foundation does hire. Our team's not actively hiring right now, but I think the general rule of thumb is like, we do view ethereum.org contributions as like a great talent funnel. Um, and we do try to empower regular contributors. And if they're looking for work full time in the space, like that stuff we do try to, try to help out with. So I think, sure it is tough. And I recognize not everyone can always work for free and open source. It's a lot to ask. But if, if you're looking to get full time in the space, I think a great way can just be getting your hands dirty, contributing to projects, even if it's just, you know, content, translations, design, code, what have you. Last piece to touch on here, translations. <laughs> um, big kudos to Taeyeon Kim, um, a good friend who really advocated for this translation program on ethereum.org in the early days. Um, when I think, like myself included, just didn't recognize the importance of it. I mean, it seems simple now and obvious now of like, okay, hey, there's six billion humans on the, on the earth that don't speak English. And even the ones who do actually prefer reading and learning in their native language. Um, so it takes work, right? But like putting in that effort up front early, recruiting people, getting excited volunteers who maybe want to learn by translating um, has definitely paid big dividends. And just a quick look at just kind of visits to ethereum.org over time. I mean, there's a lot of fascinating stories in this data that I don't have time to go into. Um, bull markets, NFTs, the merge, all that fun stuff. Um, but I think one narrative in particular that's really exciting is translations and like consumption of translated content over time. So this is excluding English and looking at the same chart, just taking out English. It's breaking down by a bunch of different languages. Um, but you can see overall th where the trend is going. We just had a, you know another record month for translated content last month. Um, very much a vanity, a vanity metric, but you can see the progression over time. This is looking at like percent of total page views to the website. Um, we've had record on record months for the past year plus. We just passed like over 25% of content on ethereum.org is viewed um, in languages other than English, which I think is not too surprising, but definitely exciting. Here's a quick breakdown. I'm running out of time, <laughs> but I think the short gist on this is like, if you don't have a localization strategy, like you're not gonna make it. It is super important. 
um, for the future of your project. Um, my teammate Luca, who runs our translation program, has a talk on this tomorrow. Highly encourage you to check that out. Real quick, because I think I'm almost out of time. But talking about the future, where could this go? I mean, the lame hand wavy answer here is like, ultimately it's up to you. Like, again, we publish our roadmap as a team on GitHub. We try to solicit as much input from possible from the community. What should we, wor we be working on? Where should we be going? Not just the content, not just the features on the website, but really anything you want to get involved with, um, whether it's general feedback, you know, joining community calls, all that good stuff. Um, I mean, a few main areas like we'll definitely be thinking about and would love input from you folks on is just like, how do we continue to progressively push and empower the community to like take over more and more of this project? You know, we've been experimenting with bringing new roles in, such as language leads, you know, power contributors of sorts who, who operate certain areas, giving them more authority, more power. Same thing with GitHub and content contributions. Um, third party educators is one I'd like love to explore. I think translating content from English to other languages is great, but I, I don't think we can pretend like that misses a lot of just like the cultural nuance and understanding of like what is the best way to communicate to this region, to this language. It's probably not just taking English content and translating it into that language. It probably deserves dedicated teams thinking through who understand how to communicate to a particular group of people. Um, so yeah, how do we get there? Hopefully with your help. Um, would love to get you involved. Um, again, we have a booth, third floor. Come chat with us tomorrow. Would love, to, would love to hear from you. But if we have time for questions, maybe we do, maybe we don't. Would love to chat. We don't. Okay, I'm done. I'll go now. Thank you.